Welcome and welcome back to the Marketing Made Inclusive podcast. I am your host, Joanne Boyce. And today we are joined by one of the funniest slash most sarcastic marketeers, social media marketeers that I know. Yeah, so I am, um, I've probably worked in marketing for like, oh God, oh God, 10 years, which sounds horrible. Um, first for a like little shampoo grooming company. Uh, where my job was to just write product descriptions about shampoo. Um, so every different way of saying nourishing, I've found. Uh, I can also spell Schwarzkopf correctly, which is pretty good. Um, then I worked as, I was at Innocent Smoothies for about four and a half years. I was social media manager and a copywriter there. Um, so mostly I like, argued with people about the colour of blue drinks. Nearly poisoned the nation's children with some conch milk. Um, and just just generally saw what you can get away with if no one knows what you're doing until it's too late. Um, then I did some freelance stuff. So I freelanced for uh, a ketchup company, a yoga pants company, wrote some tweets for Great Pottery Throwdown, uh, did one day of work for the United Nations, uh, and no more. Mm-hmm. Um, and then now I work for a startup cereal company called Surreal, where I write silly little adverts about high protein cereal there's so many elements in there i know john from his innocent smoothie days and if you don't know innocent smoothie days when they were reckless on twitter this is the the person that was responsible for that i don't feel like they're as reckless nowadays i wouldn't use the word reckless uh i would say like it's more like giving the appearance of reckless like very like very thought out like trying to look chaotic and like it was like almost like playing a character of a social media manager if that makes sense so a character of a social media manager while being the social media manager yeah 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 very very meta there (laughs) i have so many questions about those various elements like how many ways can you describe nourish or is it nourish Yeah, nourish. Maybe like hydrate or replenish. Okay. Your copywriting skills must be top tier then. Uh, That was very much a quantity game. I had to write 80 product descriptions a week. Um, yeah. Oh. And then like also like SEO copy, so like, like 300 words about combs. And I would say there's only about 50 words you can say about combs. It's... it's- bringing me back to my social media management days and it's not happy memories of having to rephrase the whole thing over and over again but before we dive into that element of marketing i'm curious to know what does inclusive marketing mean to you uh i think it's like marketing that appeals to everybody or at least everybody who you would want to appeal to probably i would say more than everybody because i reckon plenty of companies would argue they are appealing to everyone they want to appeal to. But by doing that, I'm not being very inclusive. So, um, yeah, and I also, I guess I'd say marketing it like reflects the world around you. And that's probably important. Okay. Social media marketing, would you say the same thing applies to it? Yeah, sort of. I would say, I reckon most of the people, on the whole, because people working in social probably skews I would say younger, mm. um, like there's more sort of junior entry level jobs in there than some other parts of marketing. And so I would say the good sides of it are probably more, on average, there's like more awareness and like inclusivity. But then when you drop, if someone drops a howl over, you're more likely to get like found out for it, like um, that Burger King, uh, Women Belong in the Kitchen one on, on International Women's Day. I have not seen that one. Oh, it's a beauty. Um, so it was interesting is because they ran out of a print ad as well, where the headline was like women belong in the kitchen. And it was meant to be raising awareness about how um, in sort of like the chef industry, women are actually like really underrepresented. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they were running some scheme to sort of try and change that. Well, if you read the small print, it was to help like, if like scholarships for like four women. Um, and it was like this big, like multi-country International Women's Day campaign. So it's a little bit sort of questionable. But and anyway, there was debate about whether 
the headline women belong in the kitchen on like a print ad you could debate about whether it's like how to feel about that anyway but on twitter what they did was they they just tweeted that as their first tweet and then made a thread uh... and then threw out the thread for all the other copy but so literally that one tweet stood on its own and so then all the like you know little misogynistic like 15 year old boys and everyone else is like just retweeting that gleefully and sort of taking it out of the context even within the context you could be like maybe don't throw it like that um but i reckon you could like debate whether they will re- reclaim it or, or that or not but yeah purely how it stood on twitter in like that sort of silo way but um they got kind of lucky because that was also the day when harry and megan did that uh oprah interview oh so yeah that's why i didn't see it and they put out the apology midway through the oprah interview so so there's two elements to that one is so fascinating to me how people can create things for billboards and not see how it just wouldn't work on social. Like sometimes I look at stuff and I'm like that just, it just wouldn't work, but they just try and translate the copy the same way. And there's so many brands. I saw a billboard recently. um, I was looking at ads that have been banned by ASA, which is fun if anyone wants to do that. Um, But it was one that was like, your wife is hot. And they were talking about temperature and cooling. And I was just like, this doesn't work in a billboard or a tweet or any other format. And it's clearly obvious, but the ones where it's a little bit more nuanced, like that Burger King one, I really feel like, and it might have changed recently. I feel like social gets underrated for the craft that it is. Yeah, because that's very much like a, ignoring whether you would ever use that headline or consider that headline appropriate, like, a Facebook post with that headline and then all the rest of the copy, same as a print ad is like different to, yeah, where it's just purely stood alone. Or even if they just added a little more context or a photo of a scheme in that tweet, it would have reduced the negative impact. Um, But yeah, I guess it's interesting what you're saying about like the move in when stuff is like replicated from a billboard or like you'll see people like sharing their two minute TV ads and things like that. It's interesting, you can almost kind of like track where it's been, they've thought about social last or they've thought about social Mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. So like Warburton's, I've not actually seen that Samuel L. Jackson one yet. I've kind of like seen it being shared, I've not watched it, but like the Robert De Niro one was like, clearly they thought about like social and also managed to roll it out to like TV, but it's sort of like, it's been designed to work, be good enough to work everywhere. Whereas, yeah. Plenty don't. Plenty don't. And it's so risky, I find, to think about social last because that's the area where the conversation's happening. That's the area where, you know, people are influencing the perception of your brand, of your area. And I think that was one of the beautiful things about your work with Innocent Drinks is it was very conversation oriented. It was very kind of whatever the audience was saying, you're engaging. Even when they were saying some dodgy things, because that's another thing that happens when I remember it was the Sainsbury's ad for Christmas Mm. um, and they just showed a black family talking about like Christmas gravy or whatever. And people went all over the place with it. And a lot of times when brands receive backlash for being inclusive, they just apologize or well, when it's bad, they should apologize. But when it's good, I think they miss an opportunity to engage kind of like what you did with innocent. How did you approach when it was negative and flipping it? I guess as I, I sort of, there's different pools of negative. Mm. I would say there's like, um, so even just something like if someone was saying it was like too expensive and too sugary, I probably wouldn't like retweet that and make a joke of it. Like, whereas if they were like, um so there was one campaign we did it around like it was like during christmas 2020 we did like a we made this like mock children's story about how we were going to like protect santa with a hazmat suit um but it was very much like it wasn't aimed at kids it was aimed at adults it had like jokes about like santa going on furlough and this and that and it was absolutely like fine for three days it, it didn't do great it did got like 
uh, if it'd been like a tweet we just like fired out, we'd been happy with the response, but because we'd put money and time into it, you're like, mm, it's kind of like that's the same response we get for something we crap out in five minutes. Um, but then like three days later, it landed in like some weird dark circle of Twitter and where all these COVID deniers like were getting up in arms. So we were like scaring children by saying Santa was going to get it and all this stuff. And so we like got some of the most unhinged abuse I've ever gotten. Social, like proper, like conspiracy theory, like people talk about like new world order and all of this. Um, they're probably talking about 15 minute cities now. So, um, but, um, but yeah, so for something like that, we were kind of like, well, everyone knows these people are like, mm. like, you know, full of shit. So <laughs> this is a free ticket to go wild. So then we were just like retweeting them all, just being really sarky to them back. Um, people were saying stuff like, they're like, oh, your marketing team needs to throw themselves in the fire. And we were like, okay, but we'll have to throw ourselves in one at a time to respect social distancing. Um <laughs> And so, yeah, when it's, like, kind of, like, a lot of what I do is just, like, it would be figuring out the court of public opinion. Basically, will I will I win in the court of public opinion? Mm. And with COVID deniers, you're like, yeah, we can win this one. Whereas, like, uh, I don't know, like, cost and stuff. Probably don't want to highlight people saying that. Um, so, yeah, it's, like, a balancing act. It is, and I, because what it's making me think of, there's elements where you know the majority are going to be on one side of it, but there's elements, even like with the Harry and Meghan thing, Mm -hmm. you don't know because it really depends on where your content ends up, what you get. Um, And I also think about, I don't know if you saw the whole Bud Light um, situation with, ooh. Oh, the, um, the trans influencer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that one was an interesting one because I kind of looked at it from not knowing America and being like, oh, you know, people are mad again. They're always mad. Yeah. They buy the product to then blow up the product. So from a marketing perspective, sales have gone up. <laughs> Terrible <laughs> perspective. But they kind of like completely withdrew and didn't engage in it at all. Mm. Have there been any scenarios, I guess, because you deal with like probably more softer, softer products than alcohol, but any scenarios where you've been on the line of things that are a little bit more nuanced and a little bit more like controversial? Yeah, I guess there was, there was one once where, because the old philosophy of innocent was basically like, oh, if you have a nice conversation with someone, follow them. And that was back in like, that was probably like, God knows what year, like 20, 10 or something silly mm-hmm. um, when social was overall a much nicer place um, and so over the years they ended up following like 20,000 people and every now and then you'd someone would and because you know now on Twitter it might put someone's tweet in your feed and it'll just say like so this, so person, follows. this person you follow follows them that's why it's in your feed and so every now and then someone would tweet us because something had popped up from someone we'd follow which was just like not appropriate and they'd be like where do you follow this person and you'd look at it and be like, that is weird. Yeah, we'll unfollow them. Um, and like, it turned out we were following some, like, real big-time transphobic bigot, like, full-blown. And someone someone tweeted them, and the customer service person was like, yeah, yeah, we, sh- we should unfollow them. And they So they unfollowed them, and they replied to a person, but they'd also tagged the, this bigot in it. And so then, um, then they put, like, yeah, we've unfollowed them, and then... And this person started just like abusing us and they dragged all because the like transphobic community also like tight knit and like mm-hmm. they have a lot of time. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know where they have the time. Like it's the same with these COVID deniers. A lot of them probably friends, to be honest. Um where they yeah, like what you're saying about like, but, like they just they've got to be angry about something. Mm-hmm. And almost the goal is just not to be that thing. Like but it's almost also like jury duty where when it when you are the thing, you just have to take it for a bit and then it'll be someone else's turn. Um, but I think also what's quite hard, I, I reckon the, is when, and if you've worked in social a long time, you know that it's like a very vocal but very small 
number of people. Mm-hmm. But for the, like, the sort of senior people around it, they kind of like look at these sort of hundreds of threads of abuse and they're like, well, this is the whole country. Or especially when they're saying like, they always phrase it like, I'm never buying your product again. And you're like, I, I don't think that's the case. Yeah, it's like if you were being like, I buy this specific drink each week and now I'm not going to do it. I'd be like, mm, maybe you are a customer. But when they're like, they don't even know the name of it, you're like, mm, not sure you are. Um, so, yeah. That's, that's so that, fascinating. That was good fun. Because <laughs> it's like, the actions were happening. I guess I saw um, a post from Hootsuite today that mm. like apparently over 80% of social, not 80%, that's an exaggeration, 40% of social media teams is one person. And to think, you know, the customer service person did something and then you, the social media manager, are having to deal with all of that backlash. And it's such as just don't tag, like, if, it's so logical, but maybe because we work in social, we're like, yeah, don't tag the person you're unfollowing. It was like, it was because of a new way Twitter worked then where it was like the old school way they put their handles in that tweet, but then they like made some way where the handles weren't obviously in it and you had to like, like a couple more, more boxes um but yeah it's also like the there's a flip side um i would say gen pretty much all the problems and like little controversies i had in social mm-hmm. the social team caused which is one thing i've never had to deal with one where it's like the company policy high up mm. has caused you to so like you remember when um when the queen died and then center parks were like uh, well, we're going to shut and kick you all out for like six hours or something. And like, <laughs> rough, rough, bizarre policy. Um, their social team then must have taken such a kick in. And that's like nothing to do with them. It's so hard. One of the first jobs I applied for in social was just to be like customer service exec or something at like Chessington World of Adventures. Mm-hmm. Um and then I, I looked at what their Twitter content was like and they'd put out one tweet a week about like their meerkats. And then you look at what their, all the tweets they're sending and it's just them apologising to people who are complaining about the queues. And I was like, hmm, <laughs> I, do I want this job? Thankfully, they didn't, they didn't offer me it. So, so you won so, either way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been working but the, for a while. On that note of like, the social media managers having to deal with the, the backlash of the higher ups. What are your thoughts on the gender pay gap bot? Because that's essentially the social team having to deal with a decision that's been made in turn, like not decision, but a report that's done internally. And then the gender pay gap bot highlights that report with any tweets related to their um, international women's day content. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's like, that's a bit of both. Obviously, the social team aren't in control of everyone's salaries, but you are in control of like what you put out. And so, if you're putting out a really like, if you know your your pay gap is like 40 percent, and mm. you're putting out some like really just like color by numbers International Women's Day post, then it's going to drag you. So it's kind of like a bit of both there. I think there's International Women's Day is an interesting one on social. I think it's so hard to like, even before gender pay gap, but because like people would then still be like, well, what's your gender pay gap? Mm. It's of all those sort of days, it's like, I guess if like, because normally our objective, like say innocent, if we're posting it's because we want the post to do like big numbers. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like our, our objective. And so there's not really a way to do that on International Women's Day, like, ex- ex- unless you do something bad. Like, you never really see a company, like, yeah, it's just hard. I mean, there you have to just, just be respectful and think, like, I mean, you talk about this a lot and you talk about, like, is it a conversation you should be joining? Mm-hmm. Or, saying that, actually, my old boss, Helena, this is, like, I can't remember what year it would be. Let's say it's like 2014. She did a post on International Women's Day because Bic had launched these Bic pens for women. And um, obviously it was like literally... <laughs> it's the most ridiculous thing. <laughs> and 
she did this amazing post where it was like proper like super piss take like oh we're so happy look how happy all the women in our office are and then she just had like loads of pictures of women from around the office and one had written had written things like wow look i can write my own name now or like <laughs> i don't i didn't need to get my husband to write this and it's like the last one was like this picture of a, a man in the office who just like scribbled and couldn't couldn't use it and they put that out which like just the gutsiest thing ever i think i can't remember if they'd got in any trouble from a certain stationary company or not um but it was like one of their best performing posts ever and like the comments were like amazing it was like so funny just like women being like just like carrying on the joke and being like oh i had to ask my husband permission to write this comment and things like that it's like proper proper gold um but yeah, you rarely see a company directly bashing another company on international women's day i think that's what we're missing to be honest i think that's what it is like with the hashtag days and just all of the stuff around inclusivity i feel like we're missing some of the sarcasm and some of the mediocre as well like well everything's mediocre at this point because everyone posts the same thing but there's no like i want to see someone do like dyslexia month and do like a really good creative fun thing rather than just saying we support dyslexics in our workplace like is they- it the rnib so the royal national institute for the blind or something they've done some good campaigns around as have actually the the rnib one was more recent than the kind of like the blood donor people mm-hmm. the ones where they got like brands to take out a's o's and b's from their names and things like that i can't remember the rnib one i need to check that blood donor one because i've seen the recent blood donor stuff where i know they're specifically targeting the black community and they're getting all the youtube influencers to talk about donating blood no. and i was just like i i like that i but they're doing it mainly on youtube videos i haven't seen anything on social but just I love hashtag days when you, you know, need a reason to post and you have nothing to post about. <laughs> but I feel like one is super saturated. I think I saw for like this month, there are eight different themes happening in October as we're recording this. Um, and it's just hard to keep up at the same time. Yeah. And it's also like, do you need that tire company to be posting about this thing? Maybe not. Maybe I think it's also is I feel like it's shifted over the last mm, 10 to 15 years where like I reckon there probably was a point where like the supermarkets, even just like vaguely mentioning pride, was actually like mm. kind of was progressive in a way, whereas it's mm-hmm. it's come to a point where now it's just like a box ticking exercise. Now they publish BLT sandwiches and call it LGBT and just yeah. don't do that. Please, if anyone's having any ideas for Pride, don't do that. Um, f- speaking of Pride and like Pride Month, how would you even approach that to market a cereal company? Or would you like, yeah, would you touch it with a barge pole? I don't know why I said barge pole. That sounds like offensive, but not in that way. But yeah, cereal and Pride, I don't see the connection. Yeah, so I guess it's tricky because, like, on the one hand, brands like Skittles and Absolute Vodka Mm -hmm. sort of do regular Pride campaigns and they don't have any, like, obvious link to it. I think Skittles, they've kind of been, like, rainbows. But because they've... I've kind of, like, read marketing articles, people have been, like, because they've actually so consistently done it year after year, they've kind of, like earn the right or so mm. but which is like i don't know you can debate and there's always like questions of like if just like any generic company tweets about that kind of thing I mean, you often get questions of, like so what are you doing about it are mm-hmm. you doing to any charities and things like that what we used to do at innocent we kind of got into a we found what was sort of like felt like the right area to be in was because we debate some years we were like should come is it weird for companies to be talking about and just trying to profit off it so some years we wouldn't say very much 
or we were like, is it disingenuous? We're like, we don't do anything for like the wider LGBTQ community. So sort of like the charity donations go to other things, things like that. Mm-hmm. In the end, what we found was sort of felt like the right level was we would just talk about what like company policies we had to make it a nice place to work for LGBTQ people mm-hmm. or in like Black History Month, we might use that for like a sort of inclusion and diversity update or talk about like, because they set up some affinity groups for like LGBTQ people, people of colour, et cetera. So we'd maybe talk about what they were going on. So it's kind of like, because I guess it's like, because um, whereas I suppose our old policy was like, well, we're not doing anything with charities or like the LGBTQ community. So we maybe shouldn't anything. talk about them. But actually mm-hmm. we, as a company, the, we do do it for the LGBTQ community within our four walls. So we would kind of talk about that. And that was normally, because they would have like some pretty solid policies, like very good sort of parental leave, which like it was kind of like regardless of your gender as a parent, you get like this much time off and things like that. Mm-hmm. We kind of t- sort of just focus on those things, which actually felt much more genuine and useful than just like popping a pride flag on the logo <laughs> and relevant and it's also like amazing evergreen content because those policies aren't going to disappear next year so yeah you can plan ahead you can work that in and celebrate and build the employer brand i really like that aspect of taking what you have internally if you have because i think what skittles did is they removed the rainbow for a month mm. which was interesting and then it was just like but how what why but people enjoy it yeah <laughs> people enjoy it um okay that's really interesting to look at the internal stuff so do you think if you had to compare i don't know product versus non-product socials mm-hmm. who has it harder what we're we talking for non-product no i'm just thinking hmm we could either do tech companies like softwares mm-hmm. Or, I don't know, because every time I think of charities and stuff, they have pride and everything kind of wrapped up because it's in their ethos. But I feel like product versus software, physical product versus software, um, both can go really wrong really easily because they don't really have any connection to people. Yeah, I think it's interesting with, so like food, which is obviously like serious movies, both. Plus, like, I reckon a lot. If you talk a lot of the unhinged brands on social, you'd, they often are in food, and I think that's because it's so hard to. There's actually nothing else to say, like you can't. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's this at the other end of the spectrum, and still product, but like there's this phone case company called Mouse, and it's M A U S. And basically, all their videos, all the content is just them trying to break phones in their cases. And so it'd be quite like extreme. I'd be like throwing a new iPhone as high as I can or dropping off a building. And so that's like, and maybe that's like showing the products fully in use, but it's also just engaging content. Um, so they've like really struck on a winner there. Whereas for like smoothies, you can't really show it in use. You could go down this whole like healthy, healthy route. Um, same with, to be honest, that's surreal. Like we could go very like, protein gym fitness it's not my it's not really what i can do so i I just do the jokes but like Mm -hmm. same with like kfc mcdonald's etc you can't you can't go down that like foodie foodie route of like glamorous shots of food so you kind of you end like once you've knocked everything else out you are just left with like personality Mm -hmm. um interesting on the software one i saw this one company let's can't remember what fully what they're called. They're basically called like Flowchart or something or Flow. Mm-hmm. They they make Flowchart software, and but I saw a video because they basically used these old like Tumblr memes of like flowcharts of like really silly things, mm-hmm. and they just made these as videos. But one I saw was of like dogs and like a big dog is called a doggo, a small dog is called a puffer. You know, it's like very sort of internet language. Yeah, or just going across this big flowchart 
and it was only at the end of like this two minute video that they're like flowcharts.com or something and i was like what i've just watched an advert for <laughs> flowchart software and so then i went on their profile and it was all stuff like that so they've like they found with, a niche yeah they've managed to nail it with what's a pretty boring proposition otherwise then there's like some when it's like you know if it's like check out software for your website um, mm-hmm. yeah i am like well, what could you do there i think it's interesting like the the stuff hootsuite have been doing recently you mentioned them like the what they're saying about like social media so they did like, this big report recently it's just like 80 pages i was like mm, i'm not reading that but all about working in social and i guess that's like i was talking to someone the other week who does some like social media software thing I mean, that's the kind of thing you tap into that, just like content for social media managers. Mm, the things that they care about. And yeah, just, yeah. Just focus on that. Because the reason I find products so tricky, especially from my perspective, is all my recommendations around inclusive marketing involve people. Mm. And the most I can do with a product is tell you to change the skin tone of the hand holding the product. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Um, you mentioned food as well, and I was thinking about Wendy's, mm. and it's interesting. They're, I think they're like the American brand tone of voice to the innocent drink. Mm. Uh, but I wouldn't know because there's so much just the comedy. There's no other elements of it to make inclusive. Yeah, it's, it's actually interesting with the, in, with the innocent one. So, one of my friends, who's like an academic, we're doing a PhD on like. Um, they define it more properly to me. All I really can say is racism. Um, <laughs> They're doing a but, PhD in racism. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I should I should be able to know to a little bit more degree, but uh, I'm not doing a PhD for <laughs> the pretty obvious reasons. I can only write jokes on Twitter. Um, but so they they asked me once about like, does innocent like talk about Eid or does it talk about this or that? Because you're very it's like. It's what you'd call very like British humor, mm. but they were kind of like it's that very like white middle class mm. village fate British humor. I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, that is, that is fair. Um, and so yeah, that kind of like even just like that tone and that imagery in some like when it's just like rolling hills and things like that. Um, that's nice. why it's only one part of Britain. Yeah, only one part of Britain is countryside. Like when it's always interesting to hear how Americans view Britain, they just view London. And that is kind of a reflection on our marketing and a reflection of everything else. But then even when you look internally at the ads and this content that we have, it is either extreme countryside or extreme city. There seems to be no, 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 like shitty, shitty gray towns. (laughs) Which is the majority um, of the country. I saw this great thing of like, uh, it was just some tweet the other day of, I don't know if it was like a field or something. It was like Netflix and they'd done half of it with like this super yellow tint. They were like Mexico and half of mm-hmm. it is grey tint. It's like Poland. And it's kind of the same with yellow. As soon as it's in London, they put such a grey tint on it. Mm-hmm. High rise buildings, fast yeah. moving. And then everything outside of that is like apparently countryside and horse riding. Yeah. Huh. That's in the humor one is really, the humor aspect is really ringing some bells in, in my mind because I guess maybe because I've lived here so long, I didn't, or I've been around a certain type of humor. humor. I didn't yeah. think about classism within. And then that's another way you can have inclusivity. Yeah. Oh, that's so fascinating. So there's with those product based brands, they can explore it in their tone of voice and explore it in what they're using to talk about. Oh. Yeah, I guess you and you'd see like a lot of like a lot of the big football clubs now. Mm. The language they use when they're tweeting kind of sounds makes them sound like fifteen year olds. And that's probably because they know their audience is kind of fifteen year olds, at least to an extent. Um and yeah, like that stuff's quite interesting as well. Like, even even within that, like trying to be funny on Twitter, mm-hmm. there's lots of different approaches to it and like different tones. I saw someone once did a a thing where they just like, I think mean, it was a mar- it was like some Martin people were debating whether um, 
if you follow like if you're a sort of person who follows brands on Twitter, one of them was kind of basically arguing that they would guess basically you are either a person who follows brands or you're not a person who follows brands. Um, but they basically they looked at the followers of like in a certain amount of followers of KFC, who you would say was, I reckon you'd guess would be a pretty decent overlap because they are both just being silly on Twitter. And they're very like mainstream British brands, etc. Well, KFC technically American, but whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but actually, there's pretty much no overlap between our followers. It was like two or three percent, hmm. and so there's like even sort of companies being funny on Twitter have like completely it's different not... audiences. That's so interesting because the other aspect of it, I was just like, even innocent being funny, I would still think of it as a health thing, and I wouldn't think of KFC as a health thing. Yeah. Then are you following those accounts for their nutritional facts or not? No. Okay, that's interesting. So I just have to address an elephant in the room, though. We've just mm-hmm. spent like forty-five minutes calling it Twitter, uh-huh. and it's no longer called Twitter; it's called X. Well. I guess that's one of the, you can, they can change their name, but people are still going to call it what they are, one, isn't that? Like in the Innocent Smoothies, are technically called Innocent Drinks. Everyone in the, everyone in the street will call them Innocent Smoothies. Oh my days, they are. I'm imagining a bottle, it is drinks. Yeah. It's kind of like, like milk as well. Oat milk is not a thing, it's finally oat, oat drink. But everyone just yeah, calls you're it Yeah, you're not allowed to call it milk, yeah. And then now the meat lobby is arguing that you shouldn't be allowed to call like veggie sausages sausages or veggie burgers burgers. But then, no, that one's a too far fetched because what we call it a bean patty, bean bean slab. Yeah, and then sausage is what? Like mushroom protein cylinder? <laughs> Anyways, I had some inappropriate jokes related to that, but I will digress. Um, what do you think in regards to where Twitter is now? Mm-hmm. Where do you see it going? And is it, in your opinion, still worth a platform to build for a brand? Um, for a brand is trick. Because I still, in like my own time, I spend a lot of time on that. Mm-hmm. You can get into all the ethical, like, should I be like, loosely encouraging Elon Musk or whatever, but like loads of people still on there. So I've, well, everyone's doing it, so it must be fine. <laughs> that attitude never gets you into trouble. Um, from a brand point of view, um, I think the same with Facebook, where it's just such a slog now, the way they're built, to build a following mm-hmm. on those channels. So with Surreal, we've, we don't put much into those channels. We kind of like with big campaigns that are doing well elsewhere. We like might as well stick it on, but they've got very few followers, so it's it doesn't matter. It's not it's not focused kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's probably still some companies that would mo- make more sense for than others. Like and but I mean, the annoying thing is it's still the main channel that like journalists look at. Mm. I think if 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 you do compare a post with, let's say, a million views from a from a brand, a million views on Instagram, on Twitter, and on let's say LinkedIn, mm-hmm. the only one that's going to get picked up is one on Twitter in like the press. That's where the press still are. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Which is Twitter's always been an interesting platform when it comes to like representation because. I feel like it's the most classist platform. Like I think the majority of the population aren't there. They think they're still on Facebook. Yeah, that, that, that's those numbers. It has like way smaller users than the other ones, doesn't that? Mm. Um, in some ways, it's like mm, I wouldn't say the most equal or level, but it's kind of like the only one where you can like just it was like like when elon musk first took it over there was just someone was tweeting like look no other rich person or celebrity is checking her on twitter but this this guy is like mm. we can all bully him guys <laughs> um which is it was good stuff and like they were like you can guarantee he's searching his name yeah 
That's Sorry. the one thing that used to out select. I think it probably still does where the name isn't hashtag or it hasn't added them, but they've replied. It's like, you're searching yourself. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> but, um, okay. So there's a, my favorite part. One of my favorite parts of the podcast is we're all about making things inclusive. <laughs> now I am thinking you have recently did a campaign for surreal <laughs> where you had non-celebrities endorsements with people with celebrity names yeah um it would be good to see how we can maybe make an inclusive video version of that mm -hmm. or picking another we did we did make a video for it um and it was quite it that was an interesting one from like an approaching it from a, like an inclusion point of view because First, we wanted to get the most famous names we could. And we chose athletes because it's like a protein product. Then my kind of like bar for fame was, well, my mum have heard of them and Will, an American, have heard of them. Which the, the American side rules out a lot of like our Olympians. Mm. And then my mum rules out a lot of people. Um, and so the kind of like the shortlist we drew up, there was like, Serena Williams, Michael Jordan, David Beckham, Messi, etc. But it's actually like by that bar, you were like the number of like stratospheric um, female athletes. I'm not many. It's like, I mean, there's art, like if you do look at Instagram following, there'd be plenty like Naomi mm -hmm. Osaka, especially in tennis, um, or like a lot of the both the the Lionesses and the US women's soccer team, but who would have oh, huge no. followings and like lots of fame on some levels, but not on like others. Um, so it's kind of like that to juggle of like, we can't just have it be men. Um, and then there was also because like quite a lot of the athletes were black, we couldn't just have white people who happened to have those names. So that was the other thing. You had to kind of, we had to judge which names we thought we could find more of. It's so like Maria Sharapova. Mm -hmm. Not sure how many Maria Sharapovas there are in like So London. hold on. The people you found were, actually had those names. It wasn't. Yeah. Like... Yeah. So we found someone called Serena Williams, someone called Dwayne Johnson. Um, so like, so like Dwayne Johnson, Michael Jordan, both those names, we were like, those feel quite gettable. But yeah, someone like, uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic there's probably less of those um, but then you still had to be like even though you're very much set by what name what people you can find mm -hmm. we still had to be like well we can't it would feel wrong to be using black athletes names and all white people mm -hmm. even if it is it was like they are those names but there's something about it which would feel wrong um, that's so interesting who made the call when that was was it just a was there a group discussion or was it kind of like nah this just feels wrong let's just do it this way uh, right kind of right off the bat we were like we need to like as we would I think even regardless of like who those names belong to we, if like the whole lineup was white we'd have been like that's not quite right um, so we kind of we kind of said that off the bat and it was just like extra impetus on it because the names was, related to the people. Yeah. That's so interesting. Do is that approach to name things that wouldn't be appropriate at the start? Like, do you set those hard lines early on in, in most campaigns? Or was it that one that you felt it the most? I think no, I would say for so I I've I've done work for one of my sort of first jobs out of uni, I did quite a lot of work for a like a children's media organization who were very like um their whole thing was what they wanted like it was around the time of like let toys be toys where there's a lot of campaigns about how like the pink aisle and boys toys like things being labeled boys toys girls toys mm -hmm. and it was when that was being challenged a lot and they were trying to do that within like children's books and they wanted female characters who weren't just princesses mm -hmm. and things like that um as i worked with them a lot and so from kind of like that gave me quite a there with all our characters you'd have to be like okay what 
gender is this person going to be? Even if it's just like a lorry driver who gets mentioned for two lines, you'd have mm-hmm. to like weigh up State what gender it. to make them. Mm-hmm. Um, and also like more the illustrator would have then have to like weigh up what skin color they had and things like that. Um, but so I guess kind of from that point on, I was quite, I've been quite in the mindset of should be trying to like not just go for the sort of what my brain defaults to. Mm. So anyone kind of thing. And then like, so yeah, we kind of, I think, right. I'm sort of, even if I don't say it, it's in the back of my head that I need to kind of like, or there was like, um, like video when we were making videos at Innocent, we try and show like a diverse range of people, ages, genders, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, so that also sometimes tricky, just because not everyone wants to be in a video, and not everyone is good on camera. Yep, and, those and then are the if, times... you've got, mm. if you've got less of one group or another, you can be like, you would be weighing up like do we don't we kind of thing um but i think there's an element of having those conversations mitigate some of the stuff that we see gets published and -hmm. just like saying because i think sometimes in teams and it sounds like you were in really good environments where you could publicly like if you felt something publicly say it in the group and go check it and so forth but in teams people have that feeling and then they don't and then the by the time it gets to publish it's like well i did think that was not great yeah, yeah. But it's about that company culture being able to speak up and say, yeah, this is, we need to reassess this or we need to go back to the drawing table on this. Yeah. And I, it's also like the deal, like, it's like the culture kind of like, whether they say it's like a deal breaker or like nearly like a high priority or just like a not a priority at all kind mm. of thing interesting that was interesting because i didn't realize you guys did the video for it and i it's good to hear the other side of a campaign that i would i would like to even though you apparently almost got sued several times um for anyone who doesn't know the campaign we're talking about uh we'll link it in the show notes but it's for surreal which is the company where john is working at i realize i never said your last name but you can now let people know where to find you on the internet if you want them to find you yeah, I, just, yeah you, uh, I don't really use Instagram or Twitter. There's not much point you following me on there. Uh, you can connect to me on LinkedIn if you want. My name's John Thornton. There's quite a lot of other John Thorntons. Um, just connect to a few. Uh, I don't really post on there either, to be honest. Um, I, I don't post on social media unless I'm getting, being paid, basically. <laughs> that is the um, most bougie social media manager statement ever. <laughs> Well, look, if you're good enough at something, don't do it for free. Fair. It's a quote from the Joker in The Dark Knight, but whatever. Fair point. If you're good at social, that's the other thing. They always come for social media managers' personal accounts. It's like, I spend all my creativity and energy on the company account. Of course, mine is crap. Yeah. But anywho, thank you so much for joining me, John. This has been a really fascinating conversation, exploring the worlds of social and inclusive marketing and hearing it from the corporate side. Uh, thank you everyone for listening to the Marketing Made Inclusive podcast. You can find me on all social medias at Joanne Boyce and all links mentions will be in the show notes. So tune in next week while we continue to explore how to make marketing inclusive.